Well, Bo Nix looks like he has an NFL future, but aside from him, does Oregon have a future pro quarterback on the roster? No, I don't think they do. Well, not yet. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked on Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. If you have not already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, review wherever you listen to or watch this show. So much to get to today. It's a Tuesday in July. How could we have things to talk about? I'm going to show you for the next 25, 30 minutes or so, including this question from Jeff. Mailbag wide open. As always, it's jam-packed right now, by the way. We got lots of questions to continue to get to. That's how we're bringing you daily content, or at least part of the way we are doing that. Appreciate all of you. YouTube comments or on Twitter, hit me up at smalls underscore 55 or at locked on ducks. This from Jeff. Hey, Spencer, every day are here. My man tunes in every day. What a legend. You're going to be a major leaguer someday. You are far too kind. I am just trying to do the next show. Big fan. How many times have the Ducks had multiple future NFL and or CFL, the Canadian Football League, quarterbacks on the same team? I know Jason Mass was before your time. You mentioned him once, but he was a talented backup and starter, backup slash starter in QB. We all know Joey Harrington and AJ Feely. I was in class with Chris Miller, great name, at Oregon, uh, while Bill Musgrave was a redshirt freshman in 1986. Which current Ducks quarterback do you see playing in the NFL other than Bo Nix and why? My answer to your question off the top, Jeff, is none of them. I do not foresee Ty Thompson or Austin Novosad or Michael Van Buren or Luke Moga as future professional quarterbacks. I let that sit there and marinate in case they needed to clip it and use it as fuel for themselves so they can be the best version of themselves by the time they are starting quarterbacks, you know, whoever that ends up being for uh, the Ducks one day. But the context that is required here is I don't see any of them making a professional uh, or, or getting a professional quarterback gig, whether that's in the NFL or whether that's in the CFL or now the USFL, the XFL. I don't see any of them doing that yet. I don't see any of them doing that as they are right now. But this is something that will continue to be, we'll say, an evolving evaluation for how often do you get to use back-to-back words that start with EV? An evolving evaluation for Dan Lanning, Will Stein, whoever the offensive coordinators are for Oregon in the future, the quarterbacks, coach, everybody that's involved on the offensive staff is, can you bring in kids who have outright NFL potential, like Ty Thompson, right? Can you develop him into a starting quarterback? Can you bring in kids like Michael Van Buren and Luke Moga, who have upside, who have talent, but are not world-beating prospects? No one expects them to be an early-round NFL draft pick or any kind of NFL draft pick for that matter. Can you develop one of those guys into somebody who a professional team wants to have on their roster as a quarterback? That's something that we as fans... I think should look at because we saw it with the last staff and we saw a success story on the one hand with Justin Herbert that we later learned in the NFL was a lot of untapped potential. And then we saw Tyler Shuck not develop the way he's probably capable of. And Shuck, who we are going to see in week two, which is not that far away, by the way. Remember, this is the last calendar month that we are not going to have college football. Isn't that great? I think that's magnificent. Anyway, so development is a huge part of coaching, I think, especially in college. It's not as if it doesn't exist in the professional ranks, but in college, when you're dealing with kids, they come out, I I think, arguably more often than not, more raw as prospects than college kids do to the NFL. Not that you don't have raw prospects, right? Your Anthony Richardsons, your Josh Allens, those sorts of people, but it's very rare that you have a quarterback who can come in and start as a true freshman. Rookie quarterbacks start day one in the NFL all the time. So that position specifically is a developmental one. And so 
It's going to be a test for Dan Lanning and Will Stein, or if Will Stein gets a head coaching job one day, whoever succeeds him as the offensive coordinator. It's getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I'm thinking into the future here because it's kind of a futuristic question. So when I look at the four quarterbacks that Oregon's going to have on the roster next year, Ty Thompson, Austin Novosad, Michael Van Buren, Luke Moga. If you ask me right now, as Jeff has, you know, who's going to be a professional quarterback amongst that group of guys, I'd say, I don't see one but they can develop into one if they're coached correctly, if they are are in weight programs for some guys like Novosad, right? I think Moga also might need to bulk up a little bit by the time he gets to campus, but he's still in high school, so it's kind of hard to know. I think with the high school kids in particular, it's, it's hard to tell, but Ty Thompson has to develop, not physically, but he's got to develop with the execution of the quarterback position, with making throws, with being more consistent. With Novosad, he's got to learn the speed. He's got to learn all this sort of stuff. I could make the case or find a comp for each of these quarterbacks right now, but none of them look like they're on track to get drafted in the NFL or get picked up by a, a CFL team the way, you know, Masoli, I, I think, is still playing in the CFL. Vernon Adams is up there. Darren Thomas, I think, was in there for, for a hot second. So if you're talking about those sorts of guys who, you know, at the very least become high-end starters, that's essentially what you're looking for, right? With, with the USFL and the XFL now there, if you're talking about any of those guys being a professional quarterback one day, you have to be just a, at least an above average starter in college, probably more than above average. So Bo Nix, we know, is going to the NFL. Uh, but as for the other guys, I'd say right now, no, I, I, I don't see any of them getting there. But that can change if they are able to develop, if they gel with the coaching staff and they're given an environment in which uh, they can succeed. But uh, the other part of your question, Jeff, when was the last time Oregon had a roster with two future pro quarterbacks on it? I, I believe the answer is 2009 because you had uh, Jeremiah Masoli on that roster and Darren Thomas was the backup who then took over in, in 2010. So I think that's the last time because then it was Darren Thomas and um, Brian Bennett was not, a, was not a pro quarterback. Great backup though. I wish every backup quarterback Oregon had or has, I well, let me, let me, let me backtrack here on this, on this thought that you can tell I came up with on the fly. I wish Oregon had always had a backup quarterback as good as Brian Bennett. And I hope we always have a backup quarterback as good as Brian Bennett. That is the ideal backup quarterback right there. That guy was awesome. But it was uh, DT and Bennett. Then it was uh, Mariota and again Bennett. And then it was Mariota and Lockie. And then you had Vernon Adams and uh, Jeff Lockie. And then you had uh, Prukop and Herbert. And then it was uh, Herbert and... Gosh almighty, why am I blank on who was backing up? Shuck for, for for several years. So I think 2009 was the last time you had two guys who you could say those are legitimate starting caliber quarterbacks on the roster at the same time. We'll see if that ends up being the case for the Ducks. I mean, it could very well be the case right now. Maybe Ty develops for next year. Maybe Novosad, you know, uh, bulks up a little bit and grows and is ready to be a starter in year two. In which case, you'd say, yeah, we have two high-end starters on the roster right now, Bo Nix being one and uh, Novosad being being the other, or Ty Thompson, depending on how that would uh, that would all shake out. But I, I think when you look at each of those guys, you know, Moga and, and Van Buren have a high level of athleticism, but maybe need a little, more, little bit more development in uh, the passing area. They're a little bit smaller as well, but hey, Bryce Young is in the NFL. He was just the number one overall pick, and he is tiny. He is really, really, really small but he's very, very good. So I, it's not as if those guys, if they maximize their talent, couldn't get there one day. But I think right now, my answer is what, what I stated earlier, which is I, I don't see any of them doing that, but I would love for them to grow into that sort of role because that means we're getting you know one or multiple years of having a high quality starting quarterback uh, for the Ducks. Great question, as uh, always. Another one about recruiting and what gets kids to commit. Recruiting is a multi- faceted issue. Your analysis of whether you should go bet on FanDuel, however, is, is not that complex. It's actually very, very simple because you, if you haven't already, can take your first swing at betting Major League Baseball on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets up to $200. That's right. Just bet 20 bucks and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's 200 you can spend betting on everything from the money line to the over-under to who you think is going to hit the first home run. Insider information here, not actually. 
Um, picking Shohei Otani to hit a home run, it's not, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's not a bad idea. It's never a bad idea. You can bet that and more on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. There's no better place to bet on Major League Baseball than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So sign up today. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Recruiting's the lifeblood of your program, and second segment sips are my recruiting. Lifeblood of the program. So, let's keep rolling through the mailbag here and talk about recruiting, which has kind of quieted down for the Ducks. We had a nice little roll, and then the rushing news came down, and by then we picked up two linebackers, and now things have... They've settled. The waters have calmed. They are not rocky, shaky seas out there one way or the other, though... Other schools are making a move. Oregon's recruiting class in 2024 is now at number 10 nationally. Nothing, they didn't do anything. They didn't lose anybody. This is something that I've talked about repeatedly on the show. Every day there's know this for the last month or so, which is you got to keep recruiting hard. You're not going to be able to just sit there and be in the top 10 because you're going to have risers. Alabama's finally into the top 10. Texas A&M is into the top 10 now ahead of the Ducks, who sit at number 10 nationally. Good place to be. Can still go more or can still go higher. That is, you can still do more. And I would love for them to land at least five star. Now, one of the guys they missed out on, for those of you who uh, might be new here, in which case, welcome, is 2024 five star Elijah Rushing. This question from one of the, one of the best names out there from a question asker. Again, YouTube comments or Twitter. Hit me up anytime. Animoli Marty McFly 5241. All right. Question, Spencer. Why do you think someone like Elijah Rushing would choose Arizona over us and Tennessee? I'm sure there are people such as myself who are scratching their heads. What does Arizona have to offer that we don't? Please help me understand why some players may choose another school over us. When we have exceptional facilities, an up-and-coming coach, and clearly an up-and-coming program. Program is spelled with a U at the end of it, though. Just remember, remember that, my man. Being sarcastic, kind of. How could NIL factor in? Love if you could shed some light on this. Thank you, sir. So when you're going after a recruit, and I've talked to a number of people in the recruiting world, and I've talked to football coaches before about this sort of stuff, the factors that go into getting that kid to commit vary from kid to kid, but there are certain key items that are going to come into play. And for a kid like Elijah Rushing, one thing that he is going to want to see from a football coach for sure is, hey, I have the sort of athletic potential to get to the NFL. Can you get me there? Now, we just saw Dan Lanning generate a first round pick with his defense, right? This staff, which is, you know, had a couple of changes here and there, but the top two defensive coaches and other key guys like Demetrius Martin, okay, they put a kid into the first round, that being Christian Gonzalez, who might have been trending in that direction anyway, but he really shined at Oregon. So it's not as if he's incapable of doing that. But for a guy like Jed Fish down at Arizona to get a guy like Elijah Rushing, coming in with that sort of NFL pedigree, because Jed Fish was hired as the head coach of, of, uh, of the Arizona Wildcats, coming from a staff position in the NFL. And that can be a recruiting selling point for kids who want, to, who want to hear something about, hey, how do I get to the NFL? You can say, I've coached in the NFL. I've been there. Now, Tosh Lupoy can say that as well, right? Because Tosh Lupoy, before he became Oregon's defensive coordinator again, was a defensive line coach with the Jacksonville Jaguars. And he can make that sort of pitch as well. But we're not the only ones that can make that sort of pitch. Facilities and visits. Brian Smith comes on the show and repeatedly has talked up the visits that Oregon is able to give to recruits. I think we've got every reason to believe Brian on that front because we know that Oregon's got plenty of money and that they have put a lot of effort into recruiting and, you know, the social media posts and the visits and the swag and, you know, everything like that, right? They're all in on that sort of stuff. And we've seen the benefits of that. But that doesn't mean just because that is something Oregon is able to do that it lands the same with every kid. So, Pitches to, to, to individual recruits are always different because getting to the NFL, getting my degree, playing time, NIL, these can all be factors. And depending on the kid, 
he may prioritize one thing over another. It just depends on the kid, how he was raised, you know, what kind of background he's coming from. You know, if he's from a more disadvantaged background, he might be prioritizing NIL because he wants some money to help support his family. But if he's coming from a place where money has not been an obstacle in his life, NIL might be a lower priority. And I don't know what Elijah Rushing's priorities were, but Oregon is capable of making a high level pitch. But it doesn't mean we're the only school in the country capable of making a pitch. It doesn't mean Alabama doesn't get everybody they want. Georgia doesn't get everybody they want. Ohio State doesn't get everybody they want. Because remember, we've beaten out those schools for recruits as well. We're not the only ones with facilities. We're not the only ones with NIL. We're not the only ones with a brand. We're not the only ones who can, you know, I mean, we're the most well known for the flashy uniforms. But we're not the only ones who can, you know, make a cool visit or have great uniforms or, or you know, whatever is really going to matter to a kid to put him over the top. The relationship with the coach, by the way, matters a tremendous amount. I think the two biggest things that, that came into play with the Elijah Rushings, I imagine Arizona up the ante on, on, on the NIL front. That's that's my guess. But I would I, I think arguably a bigger factor is playing time. Elijah Rushing is going to step into Tucson in 2024. And he's going to be probably their best defensive player. And he's going to play immediately. There, there is a very low chance he's not a starter full-time getting the maximum amount of reps from the moment he steps foot on campus. Because Arizona just doesn't have the depth of talent that Oregon does or that Tennessee does. So for a kid like Rushing, he can go to Arizona and play from the moment he gets there. He may end up playing. Now, he's so talented. I think he would have played at Oregon a bunch. We're about to have a lot of turnover on the defensive line. He'd be going up against some uh, you know, kids who are going to be true freshmen this year and sophomores next year for, for reps and whatnot. But he's super, super talented. I don't know that he's thinking about that as much as he's thinking about just kind of, I don't, I mean, I don't think he's thinking about specific players of, you know, can I beat that guy out or can I beat that guy out? I don't think he's worried about that. I think big picture, he knows I can go there and I can play immediately. Whereas look at the five-star edge that Oregon just recruited. Mateo Uyungle, like five-star when he committed. I know he lost the star, but like, anyway, they are both top 50 players in their respective recruiting classes at the same position. Are we sure that Mateo is going to be a day one starter? I think his role could be bigger at the end of the year than at the start of the year, as it was with Kayvon Thibodeau circa 2019. But even a guy like Thibodeau was not a full-time starter right away. He was the number one overall recruit in his class. Because if I told you right now, Oregon's taking their first defensive snap on September 2nd against Portland State and the starting defensive line doesn't feature Mateo Uyangole, there's a reasonable world in which that happens. There's not a reasonable world in which he doesn't play throughout the course of the game. But the first four guys that go out there, it could very easily be right to left. Birch? Dorless, Rogers, and Mace Funa. So I think that is a factor. In addition to the fact that, you know, I, I talk about him all the time on Locked On Pac-12. Jed Fish is a good football coach, and Jed Fish is a good recruiter. But I think that component of it, you know, Jed Fish being able to bring in that NFL pedigree and rushing, looking at the situation, saying, look, if I'm going to be able to get NIL money here and here, and I don't think Arizona, like when you, when you capture momentum the way the Arizona football program has, even when you are not a conference contending school or you don't have those sorts of standards at this point in time, you can still raise quite a bit of money. You can still really get, like every school, FCS schools have got boosters and donors. And the more you win, the more they say, hey, we want to support the program here because a little bit more money, is that how we're getting over the top? So I don't doubt that Arizona worked hard to get Elijah Rushing to not go to Oregon or Tennessee and to stay home, which is another factor. And this is the third one, right? I don't know the NIL details. I'm speculating there. I don't think I'm out on, on a limb with the playing time deal. But then there's the home field factor. He's from Tucson. So maybe he wanted to stay close to home. And that's something that Oregon, no matter what you know they were offering, what they were talking to him about, you can't offer that. And if the kid ends up deciding, I want to be closer to family, I want it to be easy for them to, you know, see me play and get to games, then Oregon was never going to be able to compete with that. I don't know that that's exactly what he was thinking, but I'm sure it's a factor. Because guess what? 
parents still want to watch their kids play. So I, I think those are probably the most likely reasons as, as to why that particular recruiting battle didn't go our way. I don't think it means at all that Dan Lanning and Tosh Lupoy and the rest of the staff can't recruit. I don't think it means that, you know, the class is going to be a disaster or they won't get a five star this round or I don't think it'll be anything like that. I think that Arizona made a good pitch. They're a program on the rise. And he was probably able to more more rapidly see a path to playing time down in Tucson than he would have had in Eugene. And it's hard to blame him if that's part of his conclusion. But also just to answer your first question real quick, to put a bow on this, lots of different factors can persuade a kid. And this kid might not be as persuaded as this kid by the same thing. It might matter to him, but it might not matter quite as much. So that's that. All right, another mailbag question here. Dennis asks, Spence, I have a question for the mailbag. Sorry if I'm not going through appropriate channels to offer this question. You very much are because I have the question. So YouTube, Twitter, always there. I've not heard any updates on uh, Terrence Ferguson's health status. Any intel? What are the odds he starts the season at Mahalo? So I have not heard anything either. And the last we heard was the expectation is it was not a serious injury that he suffered in spring and he's expected to be ready for the start of the season. And until we hear other, otherwise, that is how we should be thinking is that T-Ferg will be okay. It was not a serious injury that he suffered in, in spring ball. He went down, they held him out as a precaution because he's going into his third and probably final year here with the Ducks. There's no reason to play him in the spring game, get other guys opportunities. He can learn the offense, no issue there. So, I don't suspect that that is going to be an issue. And look, if it ends up being more of a problem than they think, he doesn't need to play against Portland State either. I mean, we should be able to put Kenyon Sadiq out there starting at tight end and and Ty Thompson a quarterback, and we should be able to win that football game. So I don't think that that's going... I'm not, I'm not saying we should do that because you want the offense to be clicking on all cylinders and get live game reps you know, before you go play Texas Tech and you know use that Portland State game, what it basically is, is a, a tune-up of sorts. But that is not something that I'm worried about until you ask the question. I hadn't thought about it much, hadn't heard anything, hadn't read anything. I think we're going to be uh, okay right there. But again, a worthy question to ask. Uh, this one from Adam. In the spirit of fantasy football approaching, I love fantasy football. If you had to build a fantasy football team of only college football players for the upcoming year, what would your team look like? So I went through and thought about this, and I did quarterback, two running backs, two receivers, a tight end, and a defense. Now, a quick word on the Ducks, specifically, because this podcast is, last time I checked, locked on Ducks. I do not have a single Oregon player on my ideal college football fantasy lineup this year. And that is a good thing, because what that is reflective of is that in every area of Oregon's offense— they are balanced and they are deep. The tight end room, I mean, frankly, Tferg would be the most likely fantasy pick I'd have. Franklin, perhaps, but there's so many targets on this team. And Franklin's the number one. But Franklin was our number one receiver a year ago. Didn't even hit a thousand yards. Washington, meanwhile, had two guys that eclipsed a thousand yards, which speaks to the the different offensive philosophies. And both Oregon and Washington were very productive moving the ball a season ago. There's, you know, more than one way to do that. More, There's more than one way to swing a bat, swing a golf club, anything like that, right? So I, I think that for Oregon, their, their depth and not have, like, having a true number one, like, I love where their offense is, it, is at because they have a true number one, but it doesn't feel like everything's going through them, you know? So the last, like, really, really good fantasy football player that is a skill position guy for the Ducks might have been Dylan Mitchell. You know why? Because he was our last thousand yard receiver and he's where Herbert was always going with the football. But that's not the best version of Oregon's offense. When you only have one guy who you can rely on to make a play, when you only have one guy who's a go-to target, who's reliable for the quarterback and for us as fans to think about on third down or in the red zone, not what you want to have. You want to have a guy who is your best receiver and who has NFL talent, and Troy Franklin does. But you want to have a supporting cast around him that could see Troy Franklin have two catches for 25 yards in a game and Bo Nix still go for 300-plus. 
And I think that's what Oregon has. You got Treshawn Holden. You got Tre- uh, Tez Johnson. You have Chris Hudson coming back. You have Gary Bryan in the room. You have Jerion Dickey coming in. Kyler Casper's in the fold. Your receiver room is deep. It is loaded. You've got solid depth at tight end. Tiferg would be my number one consideration for picking an Oregon player here. But I wouldn't go with Bo Nix because of how much we run the football. Though he would certainly have some value, but would not be uh, my number one. And number two, I would not pick uh, Terrence Ferguson because the tight end that I put on, on my ideal fantasy lineup here for college football this year, 2023, that's Brock Bowers. <laughs> Brock Bowers is a beast. So quarterback, I went with Caleb Williams because they're running everything through their offense. Or they're running everything on offense through their quarterback. Always have. Three of the last four Heisman winners have been Lincoln Riley guys, right? Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, Caleb Williams. He is going to be he, he, like, and and he's also a tremendous talent. So Caleb Williams, easy number one pick. Two running backs. Again, Bucky Irving is amazing. I love Bucky. But it's a 1A, 1B with Noah Whittington. And Bucky's getting the goal line touches sniped from him. If you're just looking at this through a fantasy lens, Bucky's not getting a lot of the red zone touches. And I'm good with that. I like that for Oregon. Because I think Jordan James, maybe Dante Dowdell, studs down when he handed the ball inside the 10. They're big, powerful dudes. James was awesome last year in short yardage situations. Situations. Uh, so Blake Corum is my first running back, running back at Michigan. They run the ball a lot. He's really good. He's got Donovan Edwards there, who's what you'd call a uh, handcuff, a high-level handcuff in fantasy terms. But Corum's still going to get a lot of touches and rack up a lot of yards. Next guy, Braylon Allen, the Wisconsin running back. It's Wisconsin. I know that Luke Fickle is there now. They're still going to run the football. They're still going to be productive. And look, I would like it more if it were a couple of years ago, perhaps, when it was, you know, the Melvin Gordon days when you're just giving him the ball 30 to 40 times a game. I don't think they're going to have that. But I still think he's really, really good. Fantasy wide receivers, though. Xavier Worthy at Texas. They will throw the football plenty. He is seen by some, including Josh Pate as a dark horse Heisman candidate. And Jacob Cowing at Washington. Without Dorian Singer there, there are fewer touches to go around with the wide receivers, as in the ball doesn't have to get spread quite as thin, and there can be more touches for Jacob Cowling. I don't think I phrased that well the first time, but you get what I'm saying. Jacob Cowling, I think, is really good. Yards after catch guy. I thought about going with T-Mac, but I think Cowing's involvement in the screen game can be a gadget guy. Like I, I really like Jacob Cowling. So uh, those are my receivers. Brock Bauer's a tight end, and then of of course, I'm going to take Georgia's defense and special teams. So Caleb Williams, Blake Corum, Braylon Allen, Jacob Cowling, Xavier Worthy, Brock Bowers, Georgia defense and special teams. That is my fantasy lineup uh, for, for my number ones across the board. All right, let's wrap up with this. Bud sends in a question. Bud's an everydayer. Marcus and Sabrina are among my most favorite ducks of all time, both for their athletic prowess, but also for being so down to earth and likable. Totally agree. Marcus in the quarterback thing, by the way, on Netflix. Yeah, go check it out. So much so that I may even have rooted for them as professional athletes if they had been Huskies, which was close for both. What is Sabrina's role and responsibilities in her position with the Duck Athletic Department? So her her official title is the Director of Athletic Culture, which is essentially a role that she, you know, because the WNBA season runs through the summer, her off season is when, you know, Oregon women's basketball is kind of in season. It's basically a way for her to help out, be around the program, and and kind of, you know, help allure recruits, right? And she also is someone, like, people like that who are just big-time stars, it helps with recruiting, but it also helps with the culture of your program and keeping things, you know, running in a way that, that breeds success. So... You know, whether it's Mariota or or Sabrina or you could find a lot of athletes over the years. Keeping them around your program in whatever capacity you can is a great idea. But that's her official title is a uh, director of, of athletic culture, which is basically, you know, a special assistant, friend of the program, come and help out uh, every now and then, help out with recruiting, show face, you know, that sort of stuff, which is tremendously valuable because did, did we all watch, I'll, I'll, I'll confess, I was not watching live, but I watched many a times not live, Sabrina go out and just put on 
a clinic. Steph Curry even said on ESPN, by the way, that he uh, he said that he and Sabrina need to need to battle it out in a three point contest because he was so impressed with what she did. If you missed it, go check it out on YouTube because she puts on shooting clinic feels like it's underselling it. You know, it was a masterful display of art. It was po- poetic. It was poetry in motion. She hit 25 of 27 shots <laughs> in a three-point contest. Where are you having to shoot the ball as quick as possible, run from spot to spot? She hit, she was hitting from range. She was hitting from every angle. She had a perfect money ball rack. She put up, I think it was like 37 points in a round, which is ridiculous for a three-point contest. It was absolutely awesome. I was reminded once again of what would have been in 2020, and that's her team would have won a national championship because she is awesome. And th- that's that's just the perfect encapsulation of why you want to keep someone like that around your program. The more you can tie her name to Oregon, the better it is for your program, right? Like Oregon's got the, uh, I, I believe there's something on campus, it's called like the Marcus Mariota Center for uh, Performance and Excellence or whatnot. You want to do that sort of stuff. Because when a recruit is walking through, right? Think, of it, think about this if you're Kelly Graves. If you're able to just kind of like have her around campus and you're walking a recruit through campus and you walk through and you can pop in and say hi to Sabrina. Do you think that hurts? I'm going to go out on a limb and say it helps. When you're walking through as a quarterback, Oregon's campus, and you see the Marcus Mariota Center for Excellence, and you go, oh, yeah, who is here? It just, it can sweeten the pot. I'm not saying it's, you know, drastically tipping the scales. But it can sweeten the pot a little bit, right? Give you some, give you a level of of credibility and just kind of that awesome factor that you got to have that it factor. I think you can do all that sort of stuff. Uh, watch, watching Sabrina do that was just it was awesome. It was it was it was just flat out awesome. I enjoyed it. I know all of you did as well. And it's it, here's how great Sabrina's become. Have I said her last name yet? Didn't think so. Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.